Yo, yo, people, welcome back to the Root for One show. Today, we're joined by a special, special guest. He's known to the locals as the Rum Football. I give it up to our main man, Johnny Fisher. Wait, you know, one well, thing we wanted to ask you, yeah? You have that uh, long headed guy, the announcer. Yeah. Yeah. He, he always has this like thing where he goes, like, Johnny Fisher. Fisher. Yeah. Why did you know why he does this? I have no clue, but. The, what you think, like Michael Buffer, you know the old yeah, fashioned, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, like the OG one. Yeah, let's like, get ready to rumble. Like, let's get ready to rumble. That's yeah. his signature. Mm -hmm. And then David Diamante is obviously trying to make his signature move. So people True. now are probably saying, "What else is he doing that for?" Yeah. But you think 15, 20, 30 years time, he's still doing it. That'll be that'll be his trademark. Right? Exactly. Oh, we love it, right? Because yeah. exactly. yeah. every time we just we, wait uh, for it. Almost, every time we watch anything, the zone or anything like that, we we wait for it. And then when we came to your fight. Um, well, first of all, go on. You, to anyone listening who might not know who you are, I'm sure everyone does, just say who you are, what, what you big do. John <laughs> I'm big John's son. Big John's son. It's getting like that now, isn't it? Yeah, it, is, it is, But no, I'm a, I'm a professional boxer. I'm signed with uh, Eddie Earn, Matrim. Uh, I'm 7 and 0. <laughs> we. With six knockouts, and I'm just beginning, like, working my way up and mm -hmm. see how far I can go. Lovely, lovely. Amazing, no, thanks for coming amazing. on. But yeah, no, talking of that fight, we, we, we all went. So none of these guys obviously knew who you were before, uh, before yeah. me. Um, I had an idea. I didn't know he was your you mate. Had an idea, I but didn't know he was your yeah, mate. So we, we we obviously went to school together, and these yeah. guys uh, when I started the podcast, and then I got them introduced them when you signed your professional contract, and then we all went to your fight. We, we tried to go to the ones before, but other stuff come yeah. up, stuff like this. But we all went to the last one, mate. You've got a fucking following. Yeah, you have got a following, and mate, I can't lie, I'm repping. The wrong for ball shirt. Got right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Got the we all got on. one. We met, met Big John. Um, no, but mate, your following is absolutely mental. No, but that's um, good. It's good because it's a part of. Um, it's not just me. The following's not just down to me. It's down to the the people where we're from, and mm -hmm. you yeah, know what? Me and Ryan grew up. People get behind each other. You know, so yeah. that's mm -hmm. good. It's a good community spirit, and you just want to keep it growing. It ain't just where we live though, as well. It's sort of like branching out now. It's from my old uni. It's up and down the country, so yeah, it's good. Sure. Long may it continue. Honestly, yeah, because the whole talk about community and stuff bro like on the way to the fight like yeah. anybody that had the similar shirt oh, so you people. just had a connection straight away Definitely. like you're right lads how you yeah. doing like, just Liverpool, classic, Street, weren't we? Liverpool Street we caught the tube down to yeah. um, Wembley. It was Wembley and uh, yeah everybody was just like chiming in and I'm like that's good because London's got this perception where everyone's like just in their own lane everybody's yeah. got somewhere to be somewhere to go to and it's like oh, right. when you get behind that and you're just chatting to strangers you never met but you've got a common ground that's <laughs> a good thing about sport in general though like you can unite people I know we've got our football teams and people have rivalries but mm -hmm. with boxing you can sort of transcend that a little bit because it's not like the, the football team rivalries mm. people yeah, go yeah, and yeah. support a person and their people people are respectful you know so yeah. long may that continue and you Thanks. know what it is as well it's like with boxing you go to what for example we went to go watch you but we're watching every other yeah. fight in the undercard mm -hmm. and we're sort of cheering for that person. Do you know, yeah. you know when a Spanish guy, uh, was it Martinez? Kiko Martinez, yeah. He fought and we were going mental because he ended up beating, he was the underdog of that fight yeah. mm -hmm. and it was mental. And then like you sort of cheer them, but you don't hate the other guy. You no, sort of cheer Jordan, everyone. He's fighting Jordan Gill and I know Jordan as well. And that's the thing that the personalities come through in boxing mm. a lot, uh, very well as well. And it's good to support the other people coming through as well because there's some great fighters coming through and, if a little mm -hmm. bit of my following goes and supports them as well, it's better for the whole sport of boxing as well. Uh -huh. 100%. Uh -huh. Obviously, you're a prospect yourself. Is there anyone else that we should be looking out for that you think are uh, not getting as much attention as they should be? Uh, there's one guy in my gym, Tommy Fletcher, who's a big cruiserweight guy, six foot seven. Oof. Got huge six knockout seven. power. He flattened someone, knock, knocked him out cold for five minutes. And he's like, oh, wow. Jesus Christ. He's been doing it to a few people in our gym as well, like knocking them out cold. Right. Six, seven but, in the cruiser? Yeah. And he's... Uh, He's massive. He's, he will fill out as well. A really nice lad, but he's got that main streak in him, that danger mm -hmm. streak. So he's one to look out for. He's signed to Frank Warren's. But there's loads of good guys coming through. Dennis McCann as well. And you've got... Dennis McCann. I, I sparred him when I was... Oh, did you? He probably won't remember. I sparred him one time. Yeah. It was at, a, at an England camp. And he's very, very quick, very yeah. flashy, very awkward. Yeah. But he's so humble. He is. When I got nice out of the gym, man. one of the nicest kids I've ever met. He is very nice bloke. And most boxers are like that because I know, how, as you will know, how hard the sport is. And mm -hmm. yeah. there's no point being cocky or arrogant because one day you can walk in the gym and someone can find you out and you know your own limits in, in boxing mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I've never had a fight in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna That's why you're so arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I've said to Alim, right, I wanted to go to boxing training, mm -hmm. not necessarily to fight, but to be in a boxing environment, yeah. go to the yeah. gym. Pick it up. You know, I know I'll probably will slack because the, Boxing standards here, yeah. Whereas, 
But it's good. It's good. You it teaches you an element of discipline, and I think it's mm. good that it's being picked up. It's I think it's from Anthony Joshua and Tommy Fury going on Love Island. I know they're they're different things, but that's when it sort of had a little boom. You know, like mm. the last ten years, boxing's really taken off. It's become mm. mainstream. They're doing it in gyms a lot more now. Mm. And the next step is to get it back into schools because I think oh, that'll be that'll be a good thing for all, the, all kids, as you said, all, all around London. It teaches discipline. It teaches respect, and it teaches. Uh, humbleness mm -hmm. and humility so no, definitely that's that's sure. a good thing to get into schools mm -hmm. yeah. i think a lot more kids are getting into it now as well because obviously especially because like the influence of boxing scene that's happened now yeah. everyone's favorite youtuber and celebrity is just jumping on it definitely uh, what's, it's what's your thoughts on, on the scene right now like do you, i feel like there's a lot of change happening yeah it is it, it is changing but like every, everything changes and everyone's got to adapt to the new circumstances and there's things that i like about the new youtube boxing i think they're bringing new eyes to it there's obviously things i don't like about it that some people are going into these fights like not, you know, if you go to an amateur boxing club, you've got to train for six weeks before you probably spar. Uh, and mm -hmm. they're letting guys go into that ring who've never fought or laced up a pair of gloves. They train for three weeks, probably twice a week. And it's dangerous. Uh, it is dangerous. No head guards. No head guards. And then they're not, they're not fight, they've not been properly trained. Mm -hmm. But there are benefits to it. It's bringing new people in if it's policed properly and it's still very new. So it's obviously developing and evolving. And there is a market there. And a lot of uh, traditional boxers like myself or people that come through the, the normal route of terms of like amateur and then turning pro, not mm -hmm. a YouTuber, they can learn a lot from these guys because they're very good at marketing themselves. They're very good at uh, reaching out to an audience. And mm -hmm. if uh, regular or traditional boxing is going to survive, they've got to take a little bit of stuff from them guys. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's actually a very good point. I think Eddie said that to you one time as well. That yeah. A lot of boxers could learn from you yourself. Yeah. How having a, f a following online helps your boxing definitely, career as well. Definitely. Because a lot of people will probably say, oh, how's this guy getting so much attention yeah. and he's only had let's say four so professional yeah. fights but it's because you don't just do boxing you also yeah. push yourself online and that's but why you've got big following I'm also keep trying to give back to my supporters and stuff we, mm. we never when we started off I never thought it would grow this big or I'd have this many I know I'd have good support but I think well I've just tried to be honest every step of my career I'm not the I'm not a world beat I'm not ready to, ready to fight world champions yet I'm not ready mm. to fight British champions yet I've got a long way to go yeah. but I think people buy into people who, who, who are real and speak honestly and that's what I always try and do mm -hmm. and from there it's sort of grown not accidentally but we didn't ever thought it would get to this stage but at it, this it's rate, worked yeah. well yeah so mm. we just got to keep going the way we are do you feel like being at this stage in your career now obviously it's still early but you've got such a massive following you're selling out so many tickets at such an early stage Eddie Hearn said it himself he hasn't seen anyone do yeah. something like that probably since Anthony Joshua after the Olympics would you say that gives you a bit more pressure because people like they want to see you in these big fights so soon yeah but obviously i'm sure you and your camp your team know it's it's that going at a pace yeah you've but got people to want to see you at those big fights definitely well it's every every professional boxer no matter what has that pressure on them because they think you've got this platform you've got to do well mm. but as you said it's just that little bit more added where i'm selling two two and a half thousand tickets mm. more eyes on me but people got realized there's a process with anything where is it 20, 30 years ago, there'd be no social media. True. You'd yeah. have guys who get to 10 fights, 15 fights, and no one would know who they are. Mm. And then they start, when they get to championship level, that's when people start taking notice. Now, for every young boxer coming through now, there's going to be eyes on them from the very, very beginning. So that m just makes it that little bit tougher in a way. It's good because there's more opportunities. You get more people coming to watch. It's, 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 it's better because you've got mm. it's more entertainment. But you've got to be careful and you're not going to get carried away with the hype of where you are. And I, I learned that, I've learned that already in my career. I know what level I'm at and I know where I've got to get to. Yeah, and no one else is going to tell me apart from myself and my team. Yeah. yeah. Mm. No, but I remember my first, because you were talking about how, you know, boxing took off the last 10 years. I think my first fight I went to was Joshua Takam. Yeah. At the, in Cardiff. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That Valley was, stadium. that was mad. I remember yeah. going to that and I thought, wow, like the atmosphere, as soon as Sweet Caroline came on, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Sweet yeah. Caroline, yeah. bash, bash, bash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was, it was mental, right? It was like, if if I wasn't doing football, it would make me want to go do boxing. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Seeing how crazy it is. But boxing to me scares me because it's you versus one man in a in a ring. Yeah. Football, you've got eleven people, a couple subs, got a manager telling you what to do. Boxing, so much limelight is on you, it's scary. And there's nowhere to hide or no one to blame. Nowhere. That's why you've got to make sure you make the correct sacrifices when you're when you're be leading up to the fight, like not going out here or not seeing that person or not going to that meeting or yeah. getting to bed at an early night. Because at the end of the day, you can have all this support network around you, but if you mess up, you're the one who's accountable for it. You can't go and say, oh, it's because of this or because of that. You, you messed up because you messed up. So True. as long as you give yourself a hundred, give it 110% and mm. don't cut any corners, if you lose or you don't have the performance you want, at least you knew 
I gave it 110%. Mm-hmm. Mm, mm, That's all you can do at the end of the day, innit? Honestly, yeah. yeah. Uh, having a little look into you, Johnny, uh, yeah. I found out you played a bit of rugby back in yeah. your day. And Boy, I feel yeah, like rugby and yeah. like boxing is like a very two different sports, right? Like yeah. myself, I stumbled across a new sport at university with myself. Yeah. Uh, I play American football for oh, Kings. Nice. That's good. And um, yeah, so like I, ju- I just want to ask like the difference between playing a team sport where you're relying on the man next to you and an yeah. individual sport like boxing where as much coaching and preparation and sparring may go into it, it's just you yeah. when it comes down to crunch time. Yeah, you're right. It's very, very different. And I do, that's one thing I do miss. I miss playing in the team. Yeah. Even going back to when we played football, me and Rin used to play in a mm. school football team. Yeah. We had a great team. We won the Havering Cup. We went 15 games unbeaten. But then rugby as well, it's a lot more physical and it's probably more comparable to boxing in that way. But... Mm-hmm. You've got other men with you. You've got other blokes who you, you, you train with every, and you're training week in, week out mm-hmm. to play in for the same goal, to win. Literally, when you're training yeah. in a boxing gym, you've got people training with you, you're stable mates, but they've got different careers, they've got different journeys, they'll be doing different things at different times. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot, it is a lot lonelier and it's all on you. That's that pressure that you've got to deal with. The accountability is 100% on you, so there's no cutting corners at any point. Exactly, and that's, yeah. that's the difference between... Uh, a team sport and the individual sport that you've got to do. So, and that's something you've got to get your head around. The mental aspect of it mm-hmm. is a lot tougher. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. Fair enough. Nice it team. sounds like you're doing quite a lot. So, you've been boxing, you've yeah. been rugby, you've been yeah. doing football. Yeah. Do you think if you wasn't doing boxing, where would you be right now? It doesn't have to be a sport, but like anything else. Was no. there anything else that could yeah. have been? Well, the plan was to, uh, I was going to do a law conversion course, done history at university at Exeter, playing rugby. And listen, I never really, I played a bit of rugby at Cooper's, um, mm. the school mm. I went to after with Rian, I went to Cooper's after that, mm. and um, it was a good standard, but I went to Exeter and it was a completely different level. University, mm. yeah. boys who went to Harrow, they went to Eton, mm. been to the top private schools, and uh, and I, I naturally got better because I was playing with better people. There uh, was probably do you mind tra- me asking, yeah. sorry, was Exeter in like, a, was it a Prem team, Div 1, it Team was Div the, 2? It's, they're the champions of the Super Rugby, so they're oh. the top of the top. Okay, they're the top Premier Team, yeah. yeah. The Kings best. themselves, we yeah. just recently got promoted to Division 1, yeah. so now we're like yeah, stepping yeah, yeah, up. That's but it. When, when you go to those higher levels, like Premiership, but those boys are like serious yeah. business, aren't so they? Like, but it's called Buck Super Rugby, so they're like the top boys you play against Loughborough, you play against Edinburgh, Durham, like, the other top, the other top ones. So mm. it's the... I didn't really realise at the time, but that was like the best of the best you could be. So for me to even be on the coattails of them boys, I was really pleased with myself. But if I carried on playing rugby, I probably could have ended up playing National 1, maybe Championship if I dedicated as I did for the boxing to to, uh, to rugby. But I didn't have the passion for it like the way I did when I was boxing. And mm-hmm. I was going to do a law conversion course and become a barrister, and I would have enjoyed oh, that. But fair enough. this is what I want to do, and this is... I know I've done other things, but I feel like this is the best place I could possibly be. Mm. What, what what switched? Because I know you've done boxing very minimal during school. Because I remember you had yeah. a fight, I think, at school. Yeah, yeah. I had a ring in the school. And you sort of stopped it. Yeah. Played football. Yeah. Done rugby. I'm trying to remember. I've, I've boxed when I was year seven. Yeah, I had yeah, a you couple was, of fights. And then yeah. year nine, year 10, I was boxing a bit. And then like year 11 was sort of stopped. Year 10, 11. Mm, probably because of studies. Yeah, and I didn't box properly again until... Um, I went to university so I stopped mm-hmm. from like the age of 14, 15 I was sort of focusing on a bit of football then it went into rugby when I went to Cooper's and then to Exeter University and then I picked the, rug- the boxing back up but that's probably the best thing I could have done because one I'm a heavyweight and you've got a much longer career and you've got more time to develop and when you're fighting when you're 14, 15 years old it's very different when you're 19, 20 you become a man mm. and mm. the physicality changes a lot mate you was a man since you were 16 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you that old boy mate, no, even, mate, even when he was in year 7 tall mm. I remember you played centre back yeah Mate, I remember, I remember, <laughs> mate, I, I said it on an Instagram comment, mate, his through balls, it would be clearances, but it would turn into through balls yeah. to me up front. <laughs> and I would score. Just hoof what, what, what did you call it? Clearance through ball. Clear, <laughs> clearance through ball. Because, yeah. mate, the amount of times, yeah, he would like clear the ball, it would come to me, I'll score. He gets the assist. So he's, he's probably mm. racked up double digits assist in I've the season. the best assist of Marshall's Park ever. Probably. Damn. That's and, uh, bro. and I remember one, I remember one game you split your head open. Yeah, oh, I remember that. How, how did it happen again? It was a someone's head. elbow came down, something like that. And I remember yeah. we went mental. I do, I do the whole team. They was getting a bit lippy, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, the other team. I think it was like a national. Game. Oh, so it wasn't even like in school. It was like an actual competitive game against another school. Yeah, another yeah, school. Yeah. yeah. Oh damn! Not like, like school football game, but um, damn. I think they, they, was, they was getting really yeah. lippy, and I think that just calmed it down a bit. When like I got cut on my head, it was just like it just all that was like the end of it, and it, 
Yeah, I think I did, did yeah. the game. Did the game get stopped? I it don't got think stopped for a little bit, but I think it just needed that break because it was getting a bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember physical. getting back to yeah. the coach. He's still seeing you on the side. Oh, I know. Still like holding it. And I had a Chinese waiting for me that night. <laughs> I, had to go to, I had to go to Harlow Hospital for three hours, and I was waiting was for an a Chinese game. around Harry's house just to get stitched. Uh, yeah. It was an away game. I, I was remember like, that. "Can you hurry up, please, and get the stitches in? I want to get to my sweet and sour chicken on Kong style." I remember as well. You was a Liverpool fan. You had, if I'm not mistaken, right. You had huge Liverpool shin pads, right? Yes. <laughs> the, the white ones. The, the, the Grey. With I think the big was, ankle. The big was, ankle. It was one bit. of those ones where it went like that. Yeah, you've know? you got the big ankle sock as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you had like the opposite of Grealish, isn't it? Like yeah, where he's yeah. got the short socks and the tiny I said this on another talk we've done. I was a Brexit centre half. Oh, my ah. Brexit. You know, <laughs> my head, head the ball, clear the ball, <laughs> no passing. Just simple. Mate, it was hoof. Yeah. I'm a hoof. <laughs> yeah. um, if in that, kick it out. Yeah. yeah. Mate, throws it. But it Shaw's was good curiosity. Mate, yeah. it was proper. Yeah. It was, uh, mate, oh, it was good times. It was good yeah, it was times. It good fun. It's great playing in a team. You know, like, you build up a camaraderie. You do build a bomb. Like, mm. you become really good mates. 100%. You've it's got like a brotherhood, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Do you still play at all? What, football? Yeah, Casually. Yeah. At all. Charity ma- I see you do charity matches a lot. Yeah, I do a few charity matches, but I know, you know, like you you lose your positional sense. Mm. Mm. Like, I'm not, I'm no, I'm not I that I was any good back in the day, but I could I could hold my position all right. Mm. And I was ne- quite limited, but now I've just lost it completely. Just got to keep mm. it simple. Don't you, you, I always panic when I get the ball pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah back in the day. I do remember. I do remember. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a ball player. But I remember because like year seven, you was probably what, f- uh, you was the tallest one in the, in the team. Tallest yeah. one. You was probably about five seven. I was probably. about. I was. I think I weighed myself. When I was eleven years old. I was about seventy five kilos. So I was. <sighs> I was a big old chunky like. Ball Heavier than I was you. A bit right? chunky. <laughs> bit chubby. But yeah, you grow into your body as you get mm, older. And then you shit, sort yeah. of. So you 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 become a heavyweight probably once you hit about year eleven. <laughs> yeah, probably. So the amount of food I was eating. I was gonna say right. A question I was thinking. So if you weren't a heavyweight. Yeah, and you could be any weight class you want. You can you can choose <laughs> in the boxing <laughs> scene, right? Ooh. You could be any weight class. Uh, what would you be and why? I would say middle or super middleweight. I think that's the next best one. You think who, about who are the world champions in that? Oh, I'm not a boxing expert. It's like Canelo and Canelo, sort of guys, yeah. Billy Joe Saunders. Oh, but I'm thinking right, back to one. the old, like the middleweights back in the day. I'm sure it was like Marvin Hagler and Hagler, Hagler Hearns, Hearns, Robert Roberto Duran. I hope I ain't got that wrong. Le- I'm Le- Le- it's like no, the I mean, four, it was Leonard, Hearns, Hagler, and, uh, and the last one? Robert Duran. Roberto Duran, Hands oh. of Stone, Roberto Duran. That was a, uh, they're the classic middleweight mm-hmm. era. And, they. and then you've also got like Chris Eubank, Nigel Benn. They were great, uh, great middles and super middles. Now their well. sons were going to, yeah, God, yeah. that was, what's that, the 80s? But Eubank, Roughly. Eubank Senior and Nigel Benn, like they're, le- they're legends like British that rivalry yeah. right there was probably the that's best British, British rivalry, rivalry that I've ever seen yeah. that's unbelievable they're the trilogy right yeah mm. no it was they actually no it's no two, isn't it? uh, it's Chris, two. Chris Eubank never actually gave him the third fight I think Ben's always wanted the third fight so what Eubanks, I remember Eubanks first Eubanks one Senior won the first one then the second one was a draw yeah. which uh, caused a lot of controversy because a lot of people thought it could have gone either way. It could have been Ben. It could yeah. have been Eubank. Mm. And so then, ne- then they never one. got the third yeah. fight. I think to this day, Ben wants that third fight. Yeah, yeah we well, never know best. how it goes. Like Mike Tyson's fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ricky yeah. Hatton. Had 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 Holyfield had a couple as well when he was yeah. like 55. Ricky Roy Jones comes back every now and again. Ricky Hatton fought recently. Yeah. recently. Mm. And what about yourself though? Like, do you see yourself in like any sort of rivalries at the moment? Because the reason why I bring it up, whenever you and your dad have like an Instagram or Twitter post, yeah. Go through the comments. Like, There's a certain someone almost oh, in yeah. every post just giving it large. Yeah, of course. That's what that's what it's all about, isn't it? Mm. Everyone, you're always going to get people. I'll be worried if no one was giving it large. You know, mm. like just listen, I'm very lucky. I've got 90, 95 percent of the supporters because I'm honest. They're they're friendly and they they try and support. But you get people who want to dig you out all the time. Mm. But talking about rivalry. Probably Christopher Lovejoy is the one. Yes, the one. That's thinking. exactly. Yeah. I think we're all thinking good, of the same. For where I am in my career yeah. as well, he's probably the, the, like the, that next step up that I need to take, and he can punch. He's had twenty fights and twenty knockouts, Damn. so he can. He can. He's a big old lump. It's going to be an hard. It will be an hard, tough test. But mm-hmm. he keeps giving it large. He's got a bit of profile, and he, he gives it, it. My fans interact with him all the oh, time. So, always, how'd that start? I don't know. He just he, when he was like one and oh, he started yeah, commenting. He started calling me out then. He, but he called out Joe Joyce on the same day. That was a thing. I was like, mate, <laughs> you're Anyone yeah. who gives yeah. him a bit of attention, basically. Yeah. 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 Your he fan base will like, who's he this? He saw a little Saturday in you where he was like, yo, I, I, can, I, take I, I can take that. Yeah, like, yeah, probably. That, that little itch that he might have yeah. had. Didn't or, it? or he's smart and he thought, I can see a following from this guy. Maybe. If yeah. I start early, 
I can he can, he will always yeah. remember me as that guy. And maybe and it, maybe yeah. the fight mm-hmm. might come in the future when Johnny reaches the levels. Mm-hmm. When I'm out, a lot of people always ask um, when you fight in Love Joy, when you fight in that American geezer. Ah, so mm-hmm. that will do good numbers. You know, if we get that fight in this the summer this year. Yeah. Um, in the O2 or something like that, I think that will do a good amount of tickets. So, how do you think that fight turns out if it does? I think I would stop him within four or five rounds. I watched the fight of him. He, he he's just a big, slow. He's, he's slow, but he can punch. So you have got to be careful. Mm. You can't get complacent. Mm. Can't underestimate. Every heavyweight's yeah. dangerous, yeah. though. Isn't Everyone, it? That's what anyone, over, for. anyone cruiserweight or above, anyone over 14, 15 stone who can, who, who's a fighter, can punch because they've got the weight behind it. So yeah. you can't ever get complacent. Mm. And it was going back to the other topic before. There was one person who <laughs> sort of called you out. Uh, <laughs> he said, and you'll probably know as soon as I quote this, anyone under 10 and 0 in your roster, I will take them. He said it to Eddie Hearn. He said it yeah. to Eddie Hearn. Big, big bad Jake Paul. <laughs> ah. I remember you posted, you posted like that, my money don't jiggle, jiggle, yeah. post. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I know that, that suit was to... far too small for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> I got me a suit and it was the smallest suit in the world. Like, I'm too late now, I've got it on. I couldn't. Oh, I, no. I, I don't think that fight probably would happen, obviously, because of the weight. I think yeah, it... and like, he wants to be fighting people with huge, huge profiles. Like, yeah. the, you know, the KSIs, the Andrew Tates, those mm. sort of guys. So. Yeah. And, I know his trainer. I know Jake Paul's trainer, BJ Flores. When I went the first time with Joe Joyce to Las Vegas, he's a really good trainer, BJ Flores, and he's done a really good job with Jake Paul because yeah. he's a lot. He's improved vastly, and he's. I see him as the best one out of all the influencer guys. He's mm. he's a he's a league apart from the other guys, and um, yeah, I spoke to BJ Flores about it when people started saying, "Oh, Johnny's going to fight Jake Paul." You know, like my supporters, I mean, and he said <laughs> the weight advantage is just going to be too much because yeah. he's like. Like every cruiser weight, he's at like one and eighty or something. Yeah, Not and sure. I've got I'll have about you're two forty pounds, right? fifty pounds on him. What are you two? At the minute, I'm about two forty. Yeah, so and what are you 40 normally 40 on like fight day? About that, like two three five, two forty. Yeah. The last fight, the yeah. scales were a bit wrong. I didn't know what happened there. It was all wobbling about. It said I weighed sixteen stone six. I haven't weighed six stone, sixteen stone six. Does that happen a lot in like the pro game? Sometimes the scales, the scales are very. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to say too much, but the scales mm. can be. Yeah, I, I was about iffy. to say, do you want to like give us an insight of what yeah. happens? But, you know, but every stuff. every scales is different as well. I might weigh myself, on, you know, I weigh yeah. my scales at my gym and I'll weigh 17 stone five and then I'll go to a different scales. Go home, yeah. And I'll uh, be 17 stone one or I'll be 17 mm. stone eight. Like, big, there can be like a three or four pound difference. That's actually really surprising because you'd think by now in this day and age, they'll get like a standardized scale. Yeah. Like this scale's got to be in every arena, yeah, every yeah. weigh-in. It's got to be this one. It'll be completely uh, accurate. But yeah. I suppose it's one of them things. Boxing's uh, boxing's always been a bit like that, hasn't it? Really? Mm-hmm. Things uh, can change a lot. I mean, yeah, there are. Boxing's a controversial sport. Yeah, but uh, you know, there's controversy everywhere. We won't we won't dive into too much because you're a pro. But at the end of the day, I have to remember you're a pro boxer. You we can't always talk. And about we don't want to go down the rabbit hole or conspiracy theory. Yeah, you know? that's the, there's so many. We, to we, we save that for ourselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we we save that for ourselves. We, we've had our talks about, <laughs> <laughs> but we won't ring up with you because obviously we don't want to. Uh, we've only got half an hour. That's the problem as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and I know you because obviously you, you you're a history guy. You're yeah. a very smart, very smart guy. Probably what A stars A's. In school? Yeah, I've got two A-stars on my A-level and then five A-stars and five A's at GCSE. Oh, wow. Damn, lad. So I was a he, bit of a nerd. You literally yeah. could have done anything you wanted to. Like, <laughs> I want to get punched in the face for yeah, anything. Yeah, like. <laughs> I'm not that clever then, am I? No, <laughs> no but um, yeah, school, going back to school days, like I remember, I think we were in the same job. We were in the same geography class. Geography, yeah. PE. 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 Was it any like French or Spanish? I think. Like, I done French. Yeah, I thought it was in French. I was in your French. Yeah. You always, you're very smart. <laughs> and I hope boxing give doesn't give destroy your, no, your knowledge. That's what I'm worried. I've got to keep G- it up give, give us your best French. My French ain't very good. You still remember it or not? Je veux dire manger de croque monsieur. Oh, it's definitely dans promenades. Wait, let me guess. Was that in your GCSE? That was in my GCSE. Are you speaking and reading? It's ingrained in my memory. He's a footballer, isn't he? Oh. No, I'm joking. Castlevania. Because I... Mate, if there was one thing from school, what do you miss the most? Because I've seen you go back to school a lot and you've done yeah. a lot of um, talks, which is uh, good. I just miss the camaraderie you have. I miss the, the sport, the sporting side of it. You know, like, not even like the PE lessons with ALEP when we go and enjoy it and it'd be like, True. it's raining outside, oh, we're going to go and play a bit of cone ball today. Do you remember? Damn. It'd be random. We might, we might play dodgeball because yeah. it's raining. Yeah. Mm. And oh. then like going, when you leave school early with your mates at like two o'clock because you've oh. got to go and play a school football match and you're like, oh, oh yeah, we're the boys today. We're leaving. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think there's nothing better and everyone who did play football back in school misses yeah. is school football. School football is amazing because you're playing just because you, 
No one, no one's getting anything out of it. You're playing it because you want to do it and you love it. Yeah. And you're going with your mates and you build up. You go to all different schools over London. You try and get to the best, uh, the best as far as you can in the cup. Remember, we had, we were on a massive cup run, didn't we? Uh, I think it was the. Was it the, the we national? We went to Blackheath in South London, oh. and then that guy, that lino, kept robbing us and every single what? time. What year was it? Was it year eight? <laughs> robbing us on the line. On like, the as line. in, they oh, like yeah. just kept giving like yeah. bad, yeah, yeah, decisions. Bad, bad decisions. Are like, well. we, we had a lot because did you also play district? Yeah, we played district, didn't we? District, well, district, our years. team was dirty, really mate. Good. A lot of yeah. the players played pro now. We had Max. a great team, didn't we? Yeah, Max plays pro. Max, Jake Brocklebank was good. Mm. Ryan Burt Allen, Emmanuel. Do you remember Emmanuel? Yeah, I still talk to him. Yeah, I see Emmanuel. Yeah. What's it, Cameron John? He plays. Yeah, he plays Cameron in League John. Two now. Sean O'Brien. Oh, Sean O'Brien! Wow. Sorry, guys. Probably done Sorry. Is that memory lane that. now. Yeah. Memory <laughs> lane. Honestly, mate. Uh, Are you sure you did guys didn't go to like a sports school or yeah, something like that? You know what school it was? It was a performing arts school. It was no drama. Yeah. yeah. Is it? Yeah. Do you see yourself as a bit of an actor then? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I leave the acting to. Uh, other people in my family. William's the actor, isn't he? Uh, Albatross. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that's a oh, good, wait, that's he a does always is like, I think it's like the Football Factory soundtrack. And yeah, all that's that. Henry. Henry's the guy who does yeah. the voiceovers. He's like the creative guy. Oh, okay. The middle brother. He the, does the, 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 the designer. He thinks yeah. of the okay. plan. And the it's idea. almost so like you've got a family. Like you, You've got the perfect people. He's like your own <laughs> PR guy, isn't it? perfect, trust me. <laughs> 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 not, not every family's perfect. But look, you've got, you've got, you know, Will, he was behind the whole social media push of of your dad, Big John. Yeah. You've got obviously uh, Henry that does the the voiceovers, the editing and all that. Editing, then you've got you that yeah. sort of. If it wasn't for you, you almost are the star of the show. Aren't you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because once you become a pro boxer and That's you had true. the limelight, then they had the ability yeah. to shine. And now Big John's come through and he's he's stolen it all. Stolen it all. Talking of Big John, yeah, that's actually go a on, great you, point you, to go on to. I just wanted to ask you about your old man. Like, yeah. how how's he found the following? I'm, I'm assuming he's like old school. Like, so wasn't yeah. on socials before that. Well, the thing is, and when, now when he first started, it was just my brother Henry who started filming him on TikTok. My dad didn't know he was on TikTok, and people were coming up to him. Are, oh, you, is Big, it? are you Big John? Are you? come with a photo and he thought it was because of the boxing and stuff and then he said <laughs> no we, we want it for you and now he's all of a sudden out of nowhere oh, so you're the one taking the pictures now yeah I'll, I'll take pictures <laughs> the time they yeah. give you the camera like, who's yeah, this I guy move out you might honestly, have to take a picture of honestly it's most of the time now, it would be people asking me to take a photo of Big John. But um, <laughs> now he's got like national nationwide tour again this year. And yeah, I saw that. Going, going right. all over the universities, feeding people prawn crackers. So oh, yeah, that's that's life. insane. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of a few student nights out. Like, imagine just seeing Big John I come know, down in the club with a prawn yeah, so cracker. He goes to student nights out. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's mad because, you know, your dad, all, all of our like, family, they come from a generation where social media didn't exist. Yeah. So he's probably thinking when it first happened and he saw the following, he was probably confused at all. Yeah, and it obviously, was. I remember his Instagram page used to just be full of him screenshotting and repo reposting stuff. Reposting my stories from my workouts. Or <laughs> Literally, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah. now I think he's on like over 150,000. Yeah, he's on nearly 160,000 followers. Ooh, and it's yeah. going up and up and up. up. By the time this is released, he's probably on 200. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was this one stage which was going up like 5,000 a day. Wow. Like it was going up. So nice. our TikTok was the same though. We got banned on TikTok. We're hopefully getting it back. We don't know why we got oh, banned. Conspiracy. Got banned yeah, I <laughs> think people, it's so, I think if so many people report you, it flags up oh. and the algorithm just bans you. And then the, yeah. Uh, but we was gaining like 10,000 followers a day and it was on 400,000. It was 410, 420. Obviously dropped down now because it's banned. But mm. uh, yeah, it was growing massively. But that's because of Big John mm. and eating his Chinese what and saying dodge. What he's it, um he's on a diet now, right? Yeah, he's, well he's been on it for this is the first week. Okay. Every every Friday or Saturday he'll have his treat. So he's oh, I his saw I saw on. a video <laughs> on your yeah. story. Healthy, healthy loads. Like, boiled rice and no, that's smart. It's smart. No, it is as well because if you cut off everything that you no, like, honestly, the diet it, doesn't no. last, does it? No, it's not yeah. sustainable. You've got to still enjoy enjoy your food and. He's doing it the right way, but he's just got to maintain it. He's not got to be too strict, as you say. Exactly. It's too extreme. It will mm. only last a month, and then mm. it's not enough, is it? So when he goes on tour, is he like going to the tour, stay in a hotel or something, come back that night, back home, or it is he going staying. around? It depends where he's staying. Sometimes if he's got like three in one week, he might he will have to stay in somewhere and then go down to it. I think once he went from Liverpool to Swansea and then to oh somewhere else so in like Oxford or something like that. But if they're close, if they're like Oxford or... Mm. Uh, just like in London somewhere he'll just come back home but sometimes it's back to back like he won't be he won't be at home for like two weeks <laughs> doing oh, his tours oh. yeah. Oh, yeah living it up the wife must be questioning <laughs> yeah. sometimes she does, she does <laughs> where have you <laughs> been he, he does, she does. especially when he goes out with that Chef Dave oh, oh, oh my god having a few drinky poos yeah. <laughs> oh, what a guy what a guy I mean the most iconic one well not really most iconic one I mean the whole reason he became 
popular was because of the the bush. Yeah. Mm. Now that came from Tom. From Tom. Yeah, Tom Skinner, Tom, right? Tom Skinner. Yeah. Tom uh, Skinner. But bosh has been a word, obviously. Yeah, I was, was gonna say I've yeah. heard it before. Yeah. Like, growing up. And then Tom said it on uh, Apprentice. Apprentice. And then my dad started saying it to support Tom. And then he just started saying it in the way he doesn't say bosh. He goes bash. Like that. <laughs> yeah. And then for some reason, everyone started saying bash like that. So okay. I associated with him as well, but. Tom's our good friend and uh, he's doing good things. He's been having his breakfast. In oh, Bino's mate, he's, he's, even him himself on Twitter. Yeah. It's like, because obviously Twitter's a hard place to um, get like a big following yeah, yeah. compared to the other apps. I, I tune in every morning. Yeah. So his breakfast, mate, one morning he's got a curry. Next oh, he's morning he's got, then, cafe, yeah. next minute he's like, oh, I'm only going for cereal today. Yeah. And it, mate, he, he's, he's doing big things, man. Yeah, he's good. He's good. He's, he's always been a grafter, Tom, as well. And he'll always uh, be a hard worker and he's a, he's, uh, he's a good friend of ours, so... Yeah, nice, know. nice fella, fellow boss soldier. Yeah. What's what's your day like when you're when you're in camp? So when you're preparing for a it's fight, it's strict when I'm in camp. You know, you see, I see I'm eating Chinese and stuff, but that's when I'm like, if I if I haven't got a fight day, I will eat what I want because you've got to come off of that strict mm-hmm. regime. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, there's no contrast. Now I'm in camp, I eat everything's clean. I eat a lot of food because I've got to to fuel my training, but it's clean. And then Saturday night, I have one night off, as you said. Even for me, you've got. To you've got to be able to sustain it. Mm. So you have one night that you look forward to on Saturday night and you can eat what you want. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's a lot of carbohydrates. They take up most of it because of all the the, uh, energy, constant training that Mm -hmm. you're doing. Mm. It's just making sure you eat enough all the time because I'm not... I'm not gaining or losing weight or trying to train to gain or lose. It's just literally fuel for what I've got coming the next day or the day after that. So you, you miss a meal. It does make a big difference down the line because you're constantly training five or six times mm. a week. You've got, to, you've got to keep yourself fueled. I don't know how you keep on it, honestly. It's hard. Sometimes you're eating like... I'll be, I remember on my debut, I can remember this the clearest. Like Just before I went into the Fight Week Hotel, I was eating like spaghetti bolognese at 12.30 at uh, midnight. Like Ooh, big wow. poles. I, did, I wasn't hungry. But I know I had a big sparring session the next day or a big run. And that is all fuel for the next day. That's what, You don't mm. see food as... That's why when I'm off of camp, I, f- I see food as like pleasure because mm. I can eat it because I'm enjoying it. When I'm eating it in camp, I'm eating food literally as a chore. For the sake of yeah. eating. Yeah. Yeah. Ends to a mean, yeah. yeah. yeah you got a target. Shit. But can you can you give any hints or any clues of when your next fight date's coming up? It'll probably be released by the time your news comes early, out. Early March, and it's going to be an away day. I can't say any more than that. No, that's it's going to be a, an away day to a, a very good city. So I think the uh, the Bull Army is going to be excited okay. for this one. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully we can early make it March. there as well. Yeah. Early March. We, 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 we should hopefully. Be, I don't think anyone's away. Nah. No, 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 we're there. No holiday plans. Just depends where the location is. Yeah. Yeah. Location. Oh, oh, wait, wait, oh, away <laughs> day, so in the UK. Away in the day UK. in the UK. Okay. In the UK. Okay. All right. It's going to be a good... Uh, it's just a good because when you go when you go to an away day like Sheffield, no one really knows what it's going to be like or what the venue is yeah. going to be like, and people just go with it. And I think sometimes they're the best nights out when you mm. don't know what's going to happen. Nothing's the spontaneity, planned. everyone's yeah, staying yeah. in that area as exactly. well. Exactly. So everyone just goes with it, and they're the best nights, aren't they? When you don't plan anything. Mm. Do you ever still get nervous like coming yeah. up to a fight? Yeah, definitely. My debut, I was really nervous because a lot of pressure been put on me. I had Tyson Fury giving me a shout out message mm-hmm. and stuff like that. That's and the thing, yeah. You're you don't know how, in like you question, not question yourself. But you're like, what, am I good? Like you do a little bit. Like, am I good enough? Am I going to be mm. able to do it on the stage? What am I going to act like in, mm. in this new environment? Mm. And then even when I fought Ali Pally, and I knew my hand wasn't right, but I didn't know it was broken, but I knew it wasn't right. And then I had the biggest crowd I've had yet, and little things just add up, and little things were going a little bit wrong. That made me nervous as well, but mm. I think the last two, three fights I've sort of turned a corner, and I'm used to the crowd now. It doesn't give me that. Mm. When I fought with the O2, I was my legs were shaking. Like I was, I was like, it took me around to get my legs. Was back that to the normal. Dylan White one? When yeah, he when he had to when he had out. to pull out of a shoulder injury. So yeah, like you're just getting used to it all the time. And then when I fought in Sheffield, it was a bit better. And then I fought at Wembley, it was a bit better. So that's why you've got to go through these experience levels because Step. when you get to world title level or British title level and European, you've got to gone through these stepping stones and they've gone through these experiences to be able to cope with that next bigger occasion. Mm. No, that's that's a good point because yeah. I remember you had, I remember your first fight. So as soon as you finished, I remember when guy couldn't get back up, you sort of had that sense of relief. I, rem- yeah, I remember yeah. that you was that almost was like, <laughs> you was always like, like this, I just remember you. Right, I've done it. I was probably more nervous than you yeah. watching it. Yeah. There, so we've, I, I've watched every one, I was sick and then obviously we watched the, the, first, uh, the first one in, in person. That was even more nerve wracking. Because you're there, yeah. But it was different because because we had fans around us, mate. Uh, just because you you didn't ex- you can't experience it because you're in the changing room. Yeah. I tell you now, we're sitting there, 
suddenly t- a guy in front of me just turns around. Who wants a fucking burger? <laughs> How many times? Yeah. Every even to be fair, even on the way there, but in a way, like especially having the. I think it's smart how getting everyone to wear the same t-shirts yeah. and everything as well because like on it's the way there the team, we yeah. don't know anyone but I feel like everyone was one big family Exactly. we didn't yeah. know no one but we were getting along with all uh, these strangers we at the station like, a guy was like oh I want a bow I want a bow like, bash, bash, bash. You, you just automatically <laughs> just feel welcome I don't know that's who you are that's what it's about that's what it's about you're trying to create yeah. a, a unity that you're all, you're all on the same page. We might all come from different backgrounds or do different things and different jobs, but it don't matter. Mm. We're there for it's sport at the end of the day and you, you're going to support someone and that's what it's all about. That's why sport is good. It brings people together. Mm. For sure. Now, but what? So you're 7-0 and now. You had a four You had four in 21. Yeah. You had three in 22, but obviously you had the... I had the hand you broke, broke it or... Broke it. And it was actually broken in that O2 During fight. two fights, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. The O2 fight. They said it's been broken since then. And you know, it's one of them injuries where, oh, I think it'll be all right. It'll be like mm. an overuse injury. Just work through yeah. it. Like. He said, basically, it's like you've got like arthritis in your, like you've just got shin splints in your hand, basically. Oh, where you're head. just like, you're cracking down your bone all the time and it's getting gradually worse and worse. And where you think, oh, it'll be all right next week, you're actually just making it worse where you're not letting it exactly, rest. Exactly, so yeah. After February, when I had that fight, I had to uh, rest it completely for three months. And that was quite annoying because I couldn't do no weights, nothing, just running and even a little bit of swimming I was allowed, but even that wasn't probably allowed. Oh. And it's just annoying. But you've got, with injuries, you've just got to get on and do it straight away. If you just put it off and put it off, it's just going to prolong yeah. it. By the so time you do end up doing it, because you probably could have been recovered. Yeah, yeah, like you could have like, when you're messing about, you could have made four weeks recovery already. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. you're better off just doing it straight away. And it's never always as bad as what the doctors say. When they tell you three months, mm-hmm. it's probably about two and a half months for me to be back to where I needed to be. So... It's just a relief once it came mm. back because there was a point where I thought it's just going to be fixed. I'm going to need an operation, and that takes another six months. And do you know what six I mean? Six months so in boxing. It just sets yeah. you back a for bit a young for back. a young prospect. Six months it kills is all the uh, the energy, the and momentum science. that you've, mm-hmm. you've sort of built. You know, so it's important to keep building momentum, especially early on in your career. Mm. I want to get into your mind a little bit, like when you're in a fight. So especially the fact that you said you knew your hand was a bit hurt, but you didn't know where it was. Ma. When you've got your opponent in front of you, what are you thinking? Like, what's going through your? What's the thought process in picking? Well, in that picking your opponent apart. Yeah, in that particular, uh, in that fight, I I felt it on the pads, and I thought because I hadn't punched for about a week before that fight, because I'm obviously resting it. I don't mm-hmm. need to punch or do any pads because I'm resting. I'm, I'm trying to get my strength back, and I was just started hitting pads for the first time in the changing room, and I thought, oh, this is alright. And then two or three right hands in, I just thought, crunch, crunch, crunch. But what can I say to my trainers or my team? I'm literally about to walk out in 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And to all my support, I can't say, oh, my hands. My hand's not feeling too good, can I? I've just got to go on out there and do it. And I thought the adrenaline will take over. You've got your guy in front of you. You've got to do your job. And the first round, I felt all right. And then it just takes one angle to throw it slightly wrong and it set it all off so mm. but all you've got to do in that you've got to adapt I've got cut in the first 30 seconds as well was that the Ali Pali one was that the one against the Spanish the Spanish champion. where it went the full whack? yeah yeah, but it, looking back on that fight, that's one. Of the, that's probably the best fight I've had from experience, mm. from an experience perspective. Mm-hmm. And I showed that I can go six rounds, and I've got the lungs, and I'll probably wait for another two or three rounds. And that was early on in my career. But every time you go in there, I, I do switch. You switch into your fight killer mode. instincts, yeah. Yeah. Killer instinct. yeah. Yeah. and I want to. I think that's why people are excited to come and watch because, listen, I've got a long way to go. I'm not a world level fighter. But I'll bring an exciting fight. I'm going in there to try and take the other guy out. That's heavyweight. That's that's what people want to watch. People want to watch people who go in there to try and dismantle the other guy. Yeah. I might not be the prettiest guy to watch all the time, but I will give you an entertaining fight. I believe me, it's pretty. Honestly, (laughs) yeah. There's some heavyweights that I watch and I'm like, really? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Some like who don't train properly, don't eat Mm -hmm. right, and it, it shows in the ring. So as long as you, as I said, as long as you invest and you do the right things in the build up, you can't moan at what the last result is because you've done everything you can. Yeah. yeah. You've spoken about, like, coming over adversity. Um, do you have, like, anything you want to say to, like, even, like, other sports players, like, about understanding their bodies and, like, yeah. sort of, like, knowing when it's right for you to actually take that time to recover and that? Because I've got, like, there's a few players on yeah. our team that, of course, get injured as the season goes on. It's a yeah. long season. And uh, sometimes they do come back a bit early. Yeah. And then that what, what does no, that do? That it, kicks back their recovery time another six weeks. It's a maturity thing, I think, because like, we've all been there. We've all think, oh, it, it'll be all right. I'll be all right. But if you've got to be mature enough and you've got mature enough and you've got to be conscious, conscious of your own position. And there's always things when you're injured, just say you've injured, there's other things that you can improve on and it gives you time to reflect on other things. I've done a lot of balance work and a lot of core work with my trainer, Sonny Cannon, my strength and conditioner. Mm. So you might be losing in one area and you're thinking, oh, 
you can't get disheartened by it. You've got to work on other things. And then before you know it, you're back in the swing of things, ready to go again. So, yeah, injuries are always tough. But you've got to think, why has this happened? It's happened for a reason. It's mm -hmm. told me to work on other things. Mm -hmm. And I could have I could have not got injured. I could have fought my next fight and I could have lost. That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. There's always the uh, the other aspect of it. What if I didn't get injured? Could that have... It's just happening to me for a reason. That's what I always think. I do believe in that. I believe in fate, and I think I think things happen for a reason. Mm. And it was good because it gave me a little bit of a break. I was getting a lot of hype around me at that point as well, probably more than I needed. I know it's good to have a lot of support, but people were expecting a bit too much of me. So it's good. It just gave me a time to reflect, relax, think about where I want my career to go. And then I came back in August and got a, a good round two knockout, probably my cleanest knockout I've ever got. So mm. it's like the bubble. It, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it happens. It happens for a reason. Um, you mentioned before that Tyson Fury gave you a little shout out when you first started as well. Yeah. Uh, what's your relationship like with him? Yeah, I, I don't talk to Tyson all the time, but he talks quite a lot to my dad, and um, I've got I, I met his dad, Big John Fury, as well. Mm -hmm. Really, really nice guys. Really, really friendly. Offered me great advice as well. They said, "You've got one career in boxing. The promoters have got a hundred other fighters. The managers have got ten other fighters. You've just got yourself. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make sure that you look after number one, and don't try and be diddy daddy for other people." Yes, it's business. Yes, you have great relationships with other people. But in boxing, as soon as you on the wayside or things ain't going right, people will spit you out and forget about you. So mm. you've got to do what's best for you 100%. 100%. And look at him. He's, he's at the top of the pile. So you've got to take that advice when it comes to you. I mean, he probably could be fighting Yusick or Joe Joyce next. Yeah, Joe Joyce. I so personally hopefully. think it'll be Joe. Yeah. I don't think they're, both with Frank Warren. they're both with Frank Warren as well, so that makes it easier. Mm. I think there's rumours of a fight maybe in March, April between Usyk and Fury for the Undisputed. Mm -hmm. We'll do it. And then Joyce uh, could be later in the year. So that would be good. Interesting. Joyce Are you mates with like Joyce and that as well? Yeah, good friends with Joe Joyce. He's managed by the same guys as me. Mm -hmm. Gone a lot of training camps with him. And um, really, really nice down-to-earth guy. A lot of people don't give him enough credit for how good he actually is. I gained a lot of credit last fight. Yeah. The one people against are now Parker. Starting, people are now starting yeah. to see what... Because when you look at Joe, yeah, he probably ain't the prettiest fighter. He's not the most fluent. But he's big, he's strong, he's fit, he can punch. He he's can take a unbelievable punch. jaw. Yeah. When you're trying to build a heavyweight, they're probably the core principles that you need to be a good heavyweight. Mm -hmm. So for anyone, and I think Tyson knows it as well, it's going to give him a really, really hard night's work. And you're probably going to have to go 12 rounds against him. So mm -hmm. it is grueling. Even when I was sparring for six rounds or eight rounds, it's it's hard it's hard hard work. So to do that for twelve rounds with ten ounce gloves on, you've got to be something special. So what's does, crazy? He'll, he'll, he'll push yeah. Usyk and Fury all the way. Mm -hmm. What's crazy yeah. is I didn't realize how hard ten ounce gloves are. Yeah. Until I put ten ounce gloves on once, and I just sort of done it to myself. I was like, oh my god! No. It's basically your knuckle at that point. Yeah, it's basically, very light yeah, gloves. Yeah, it's basically you, MMA. You with bigger gloves, right? Like yeah. Like yeah. The right. bigger gloves give you a bit of cushion, and it's the it, when you're fighting, they've got different. Uh, different materials inside. Mm -hmm. I think when you're in sparring gloves, there's more foam and things. I think... More padding. I think like you've more got safety. horse hair. When you fight in fight gloves, I think they're horse hair. I don't know if I'm getting this correct, but it's a different material ah. and it's less dense and it could transfer the oh. power a lot easier. So that's why you see more knockouts, obviously, in, in, in fights. fight compared to sparring. Because obviously they're, they're smaller gloves and they're not as heavy, so... Oh. And they're not as dense, so mm. the f power transfer is a lot, oh. a lot quicker. Because, Alim, you, you obviously, you're the most... Boxing man here at Hotspur. <laughs> I had a couple of amateur um, fights. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> obviously, what, what, what was you like when you were doing amateurs? What's amateur? Sixteen or fourteen? Uh, no, um, it depends on your weight class. Yeah. So I was fighting in tens as well. Yeah, tens. Would you be fighting in twelves? No, because yeah, you're yeah, twelves. Yeah. But the difference with the amateur gloves is you can't. It's harder to close the fist. Yeah. So you've got to really clench with the uh, with the professional gloves. Like they fit in, and you you're there. With an amateur glove, like if you just relax your hands, your hands will probably stay around there, mm -hmm. wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. What club did you uh, box at? Uh, Limehouse Boxing Academy. Oh, yeah, nice. Wow. F fairly new, but at the time they were new. I think they're yeah. getting bigger now. They've got a few national champions. That's good. Um, so they're growing, and you might see us back there again soon. Because so. <laughs> where, where, where was your fight? You, you, I remember you mentioned that fight in Liverpool. And it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> have you, uh, so, Johnny, have you ever had like an amateur fight or any fight where it's sort of. You haven't really got any fans because every fight yeah. you and away sometimes because I remember you you because you, you, you got traveling Ali fans now. I, I so. fought in Ali Pally when I was thirteen years old and it was mm -hmm. like in the middle of the school day and I took a little bit. It was like the afternoon, like one o'clock in the afternoon in the school day and you just go up there with your dad and your trainer and that's it. And like, was all of that boxing and was all of that 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 fight? Did they bring people and it was just no, no, it was just me. Oh, school, wow. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I always, I've always had like three or four. Like it was only when I started boxing at university. 
Mm-hmm. I had a couple of amateur fights there. Like I brought 500 people from the uni and from, from home. So that was like the first when it first started. Uh. But amateur boxing, you're doing it with like no one watching a lot of the time as well. So it's like, it's good. It's raw and it's, it's part of the education as a fighter to do a little bit of amateur boxing, I think. Do you think, because I, I was thinking about this recently, I don't think amateur boxers get enough credit as they should because when you hear the name amateur, you think they're probably not that good, they're no. not amateur. But no. there's semi-pros out there, which is like white collar. Yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah. But there's a lot of amateurs that are better than a lot of pros, that are better H- than a lot of semi-pros times. as well. 100%. But it's just the way... The way boxing is very humble. Mm-hmm. The fact that we call ourselves amateurs when we're amateurs, it makes people, as you said, people think, "Oh, he, sh- he, sh- he must be shit." Then, mm-hmm. but that's not what it, that's not what it's. Uh, it's a different it's about. category. It's a different. Yeah, it's different. And you've got you've got Olympians who, who, am, who are amateurs. People who go and win an yeah. Olympic gold medal, probably better than fifty percent of the professionals that go out there, and are, are definitely better than all the white collar guys out there. Mm-hmm. But as you said, there's a lot. There's like a, there's been a little rise in the white collar scene and the semi pro guys who probably go around the yeah, I'm a fighter and they've got no head guards on and they they've got the smaller gloves and they it mm-hmm. looks like a professional ring but mm-hmm. they wouldn't they wouldn't last two minutes with a lot of the amateur guys. I mean look at the Eastern Europeans, they do like three hundred, four hundred amateur fights. Well who's one of the examples? Yeah. yeah. So Lomachenko, 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 yeah. The they they all done three, four hundred fights, suddenly yeah. now you're turning pro. Yeah. yeah. So they're they're fighting for a belt in like but I also well, think in, in other especially for heavyweights you can sort of you can hang around amateur too long. And you bec- can become stale because it is a completely different to professional and amateur. That's one thing I noticed. I wasn't, I didn't have a long amateur career, but the style is completely different. And mm-hmm. especially when you're going heavyweight, where it's got to slow down a lot more because you're bigger units. You've got a, you've got to fight twelve rounds, and rounds, eighteen stone man. You've got, to, you've got to slow down. You've got to break people down. Mm-hmm. But it is, it is completely different. So sometimes you can be like a. Uh, uh, an amateur and you can be there when you're 25, 26, 27, 28 and if you're like a, a lightweight or middleweight most of your career is sort of gone then you've got to sort of be fast track so if you are staying amateur for that amount of time you want to be like an Olympian or won a world championship because mm-hmm. you want to be then thrown into that that mix as a as a professional quite early mm-hmm. I think of Galau Yefai he's one who's done it very well he's won Olympic gold and mm-hmm. now he's Is that the recent one? Yeah he's knocking on world titles and things I like think that, that was the one where I remember he won the Olympic. And then I think like his first fight, he fought for a belt. Yeah, I think it was his 10 round or something. I was like, I, I, I remember title. saying to him, I was like, how does that, how does that work? And then you they're, told they're, me. They're, they're a family of fighters as well. Yeah. There's, there's a few brothers. There's another one as well, yeah. I think they're all trying to fight on the same card soon, but it just never works Imagine out. Imagine that. Right. Uh, like be good. Three, four yeah, brothers. Fight, every fight, yeah. fight, that would <laughs> be <laughs> mental. But yeah, I was, I was just thinking, hopefully that much scene gets a bit more attention. Because I think that's why there's a lot of controversy, with, especially with the influencer yeah. side of things. People are annoyed that, yo, I've been boxing my oh, whole yeah. life, but I'm not getting near enough the same amount of money or near enough as the credit as I should yeah. compared to someone who's just started boxing. I agree. I, agree. I think, like, British TV should do more to, like, these national, when I see national fights, if you see if you watch an amateur fight, a national boxing fight, like England boxing or whoever it is, or the Euros, I think if that was on TV, it would encourage a lot yeah. more amateur boxers, mm. people to get more, a bit more I do. I do agree that we need to put amateur boxing out there as I said, not only for schools, but give people more credit. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day as well, I look at it from the other perspective, professional boxing and boxing, it's an industry, it's a business. Mm-hmm. It's mm. not just about uh, like the amateur boxing, we're doing it because we love it. We're doing it because it's f- we're doing it for free because we want to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we've got to sort of learn, as I said, from these influencer guys, they're building up followings and at the end of the day, money talks. Mm-hmm. And that's why people are tuning in to watch it because they've got, these mm. followings. If KSI just say he had 10 million followers, if 1% of his followings go and uh, watch him fight, that's a lot of pay-per-view by it. Yeah, it is, yeah. Mm. So yeah. a lot more than what a lot of people can pull in this country. So It's true, you have to adapt. Money talks, you have that's to adapt or you die. Yeah, that you brought up earlier that you, you'd be like actually pro to seeing boxing being brought back into schools and yeah. I just wanted to ask you the question of like do you think that there's more like for example that could be done in like even the university scene because we're all still amateurs and yeah. we're playing a uni sport mm-hmm. but yeah. we have like an institution behind us and we have like the Bucks League yeah. where we get to go up north and yeah. ver- ver- verse like north versus south yeah. like we have all star games in American football and yeah. obviously boxing you guys probably have a championship right? Yeah boxing we have a Bucks championship as well but as you said it's, it's another one it's not like rugby or cricket or even like American football's growing massive in the universities now. Bo- mm. Boxing's always been that one that's on on the side of like in education. It's not really been too dangerous. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's mm-hmm. what a lot of people you joke about it, but that's what a lot of people's attitudes are like yeah. towards there boxing. Is, well, honestly, it's it too dangerous. So you're trying to punk. They don't have an understanding mm. or for f- but for kids to sound. This is not going to sound politically correct, but people in 
urban environments who've got who are around life crime or around the trouble mm. you get put in a boxing gym it's gonna it could change your life because 100%. you're in it you've got structure you've got older people who are disciplining you you've got people who, who are telling you right from wrong and that can save a lot of kids lives but a lot of these academics and people of educate in education they can't see past what they know in their little bubble exactly they don't see what the real world's mm -hmm. like exactly, so yeah and that's I, why when I went to university, I was in, I was being in a seminar, and um, the woman, I'd, I'd walk in, the lady, the teacher would say, oh, "Oh, where have you been? You've been beating someone up on the street again." And I'm like, "This is not what boxing's yeah. about. We've it's never totally been brought exactly, to be. Yeah. We've never been brought." And it not offended me because I'm not I'm not a wet wipe. Do you know what I mean? But it's just <laughs> yeah. like you just don't have a clue like what what boxing's all about, do you? Nah, so nah, honestly, it's a big I, divide in the in the country about combat sports. And I, and, I, and I honestly uh, to agree with you, I don't think it's just even like for example the 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 seminar leaders and the teachers and the lecturers fault it's like the yeah. fact that a lot of these university amateur clubs are student run yeah like, yeah, like you, you have a president who's a player who might be competing as well but he's got presidential duties where he's got to run the club make Definitely. sure the budgeting's right you're yeah. messaging the su 100%. so it's like as a student when you're playing it's for a student-led so team it takes it's up like so a whole much job time. it's like a whole it job is. my good friend nicholas eaton who ran it at exeter and we sort of grew it when we first went there there was like 50 people in a in the amateur boxing club we grew it to 650 people <laughs> it was the second biggest club in the in the uni i think behind rugby yeah, yeah. so it grew massively yeah. but as you said the admin that has to go into doing that of course he, 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 he took over his life and I was Signing only the squad captain up, getting I was the just, insurance yeah. done yeah. getting the SU to sign off on Anything, it any events you do you've got to get health and safety checks and stuff like that it's mm -hmm. like running a little business and exactly. fair play to him and he, he done a really good job and I was lucky all I had to do was turn up and do some of the sessions <laughs> and I could go <laughs> home but yeah. So I couldn't do that, all that stuff that he was doing. So it takes a lot of effort. It is a lot, honestly. And I feel yeah. like if they did step in and the uni, like, for example, did provide a bit more support or yeah. even, even like just more public support, yeah. like there wouldn't be that disparity where you get a seminar leader saying what you've been beating someone up. No, they would actually know yeah. what the impact no, of the sport right. is. It's just still that um, stigma around boxing, I think. There still is. But it's getting it's getting better. People understanding it's about respect, it's about humility. And at the end of the day, people have always throughout history have wanted to see people fight. So True. from gladiator time. So literally you can't put it under whatever you do, if you if you don't embrace it, it'll just push it underground and it'll become more dangerous. So what we need to do is put it into schools and teach people the, the proper way to conduct yourself and to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you say to like the people that are trying to balance doing extracurricular activities like sports or performing arts, but while still trying to keep on top of their education yeah. as well? I was like that guy at school Really knows he was similar as well. You, you're trying to do all the sports you can, yeah. and I think you sh you've got to do it, and it, it benefits you if you do it. If you do, because it makes you manage your time better. Mm -hmm. I actually find when I went to university and I had a lot more free time, I didn't manage my time nowhere near as well as when I was doing A levels and GCSEs. That's for sure. It's true, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm trying. When I was at GCSE and A level, right, I've got to play football, I've got boxing, I've got to do this, but I've also got to do all my A levels and my GCSEs. You, you, you've got no time, mm. so it forces you to be more uh, to manage yourself better. So. Trust me, from my experience, it's better to be overloaded with work because it forces you to be more adaptable and, and, and work better mm. than if you went to university and when you've got like, oh, I've got, I've got nothing on today, I could just sit about and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Sack it off, yeah. literally, yeah. yeah. It's what yeah. happens, you get lazy. And you, you fall into you a lazy you lived mindset. you in campus as well? Yeah, you lived on like campus that. and stuff. So you just get into family. You get into a lazy mindset. You mm. just, I just thought, I just loved eating. I just used to sit in a room and eat. <laughs> my first year, I just kept myself to myself. But yeah, yeah, the yeah. second year, when I started boxing again, that's when I actually started to do better and engage more with university life because mm. I had more of a, I had to stick to a schedule a little bit better and it made me appreciate when I had free time a little bit more, you know? Yeah, I wonder what that teacher's going to say now. Yeah. Yeah. Seven and <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I've, got, I've got one last question myself. Um, everyone's going to be asked this if you're a boxer. Dream location of a fight. Oh, this is a tough one. I'd love to, the one that always sticks to my mind it will probably be the, it's Las Vegas. So I'd love to take the Bull Army That's over to Las Vegas. Oh, it's like wait, I think you know. I think that would be like by the time we get to that stage. Yeah. Do you remember when uh, Ricky Hatton yeah, fought Floyd Mayweather, yeah. and it, it was almost as if they weren't in Vegas. You, oh, it's like it was a fight happening over of here. Of uh, Mancunians walking. Exactly. About. Yeah. <laughs> when there more people went more over there than actually mm. bought tickets or something. It's brilliant. But and the stadium it's sounded like that. I just think that's where my journey started with the pro boxing when I first went and sparred Joe Joyce, and I didn't even think I was going to be a professional then. I was just doing it because I loved it. And then if it ended there, or well, that's where the dream fight would. That it makes sense that the dream fight would be in Las Vegas yeah. in mm -hmm. the MGM Grand or something like that. Oh. Um, just lastly as well, boxing aside, well, what's the end goal? The end goal always has been 
you've got to make a living in life as well and you've got to make people comfortable. And my mum and dad have done a lot for me and it's to buy them a house or to make sure they never have to struggle again. Look mm. after my brothers. You used to look after your family. What what do we all do things for? We do it because we want to help our family, want to make them proud. Mm -hmm. That's what life's all about. People you don't, you care don't, about it, yeah. Yeah, you don't do it, for, you really, yeah, you do it for yourself to achieve it, but mm. you're doing it because you want to make everyone around you have a better life as well. So the end goal mm. is to make sure everyone's as happy and as healthy as they can be. That's a humble answer. It's Thank true, you. though. It's true. No, that's, that's I'm sure we can all agree with that one. Yeah, well. That's that for is sure. And that, that, that's some food for thought. And I uh, actually want to thank you down for coming down, Johnny, oh, thank today. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed uh, it. No, honestly, it, it's been a pleasure. And I want to thank all you guys at home that's listening and in tuning into the 22nd episode of season two of the Route 411. Thank Any you very much for it? listening. No, um, honestly, you're our first guest. And it's Thanks for having me on. not only just that, but it's also helped us now for future guests and yeah. uh, hopefully maybe more some more boxes and, and give them a maybe platform as well to give us a bit of insight. Yeah. Get, get, get Big John on next time. Yeah, that's us wrapped up, guys. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week.